is Kylie Briggs. I'm the director of conservation for the Orian Society. We're a nonprofit organization that specializes in conserving critical habitat for rare reptiles and amphibians. Uh, the, a lot of our work is done in the southeastern United States uh, surrounding this species, the eastern indigo snake. Um, they're the largest snake native to North America, and they are federally threatened. Um, but here in the Northeast, uh, I'm not thinking about indigo snakes at all. Um, a lot of my work is really focused around monitoring and conservation of wood turtles. However, I don't want to talk to you about snakes or turtles today. Uh, We're going to be focusing on vernal pools. And uh, first, I, you know, I, I usually would start just by telling people what a vernal pool is, but it occurred to me that maybe defining the word vernal would be helpful. Of, in, or appropriate to spring. Uh, so spring related, uh, we've got that uh, figured out at least. This is your classic vernal pool, shallow wetland in the middle of the woods. And what makes it a spring uh, habitat is that these are seasonal pools of water. Uh, they're not there all the time. Um, critical habitat for many plants and animals. Um, also, people may call them vernal ponds or ephemeral wetlands. Uh, ephemeral, another word associated with spring. And uh, that spring portion really has to do with the annual life cycle of a vernal pool. So vernal pools fill with snow, with snow melt and rainwater in the late spring and, uh, sorry, in the early spring, late winter. Uh, they hold water for at least two months. That's what sets them apart from something like a, uh, like a mud puddle. And um, even though they hold water for quite a while, several months at least, maybe quite a bit longer, uh, they do eventually dry out. They're not a permanent feature on the landscape. And then that cycle repeats. So after they, they go bone dry in the late summer, early fall, uh, winter happens again, and then they fill back up with water. Uh, so these sites are critical habitat for a number of species of wildlife. Um, I think the, the flagship species, what most people think of when they think of a vernal pool and the wildlife that lives in it, is frogs and salamanders, woodland species. Uh, this is a picture of wood frogs mating on top of a huge collection of wood frog eggs. And uh, part of why this is a critical habitat for amphibians goes back to this component of, of my slide a moment ago. The ponds, e the pools eventually dry out by mid to late summer. Uh, so this is a fishing lure. This particular fishing lure looks like a frog and people wouldn't make fishing lures that look like frogs unless fish eat frogs. So um, the, the reason that pools drying out are a big benefit to amphibians is that there are no fish in these pools. Fish are major predators of uh, amphibians and their eggs, as well as of many of the in insects that live in vernal pools. Um, so that drying out really is just what keeps that habitat free of predators. So uh, no fish, good for frogs and salamanders. Uh, some of the wildlife that lives in pools, just uh, example species. Um, woodland amphibians, that would include Jeff the Jefferson salamander, spotted salamander, wood frog. There are a few others. I'll talk about those more in a moment. Uh, invertebrates, mostly we're talking about aquatic insects, uh, the larval caddisflies, fingernail clams, so not, not all insects, uh, fairy shrimp and sea shrimp, those are crustaceans. Uh, lots of stuff that live in these pools. Uh, and some of these you really only find in vernal pools or certain species. Uh, you'll find very closely associated with these uh, temporary wetlands. So uh, all amphibians have aquatic larvae um, and most of them will lay their eggs in the water. Some do lay their eggs on land and the larval form will actually go through its entire development inside the egg, um, but that's not usually the case. Uh, some species of amphibian uh, that live in water year round, they're adapted to dealing with fish and they'll lay their eggs in permanent water. Uh, but for these woodland species, uh, the vernal pools, if you don't have the vernal pool, you're really not going to have uh, the, the, the frogs or salamanders. Uh, so them drying out, what makes them a vernal pool, great for the salamanders, but there's a downside. So going back to the life cycle of a vernal pool, uh, they look quite different depending on what time of the year you visit them. Uh, so the spring full of water, great breeding conditions, but in the winter and summer when the pools are either iced over or completely dry, uh, those are bad breeding conditions, but uh, not just for breeding, those are bad places for the larval salamanders or frogs to still be. Uh, so because they dry out, frogs and salamanders that breed in vernal pools, they're in a race against the clock. So uh, this diagram shows the, um, the life cycle of a wood frog, uh, these frogs emerge in the late winter, early spring. 
Uh, typically, uh, at least where I live in northern Vermont, that'd be April through May. Uh, they'll lay their eggs in the vernal pools. Uh, those eggs will hatch in nine to 30 days. Uh, you'll get a tadpole that lives in the pool for two or three months. Uh, and then eventually by July uh, through September, those frogs will uh, mature and metamorphose, transform into adults and they will leave the wetland. Uh, so July to September, that's a pretty long time for a wetland that's going to dry up in uh, at some point in the summer uh, or early fall. So uh, during July, sometimes conditions look like this across the, uh, across the country. And these are not good conditions for a seasonal wetland to retain its water. And as a result, Many times these wetlands dry up before the eggs have a chance to hatch or before the larvae have a chance to metamor metamorphose and leave the wetland. These are, these are uh, wood frog eggs that are not long for this world. Um, they're, they've just barely been laid and this wetland is already mostly dried up. In a couple of weeks, there won't be any water here. Uh, so it's really a gamble. Uh, not having fish, good for the frogs and salamanders, but because they dry up, that's this other, other factor. Uh, so as a result of this, wood frogs, spotted salamanders, all of these species are really in a race against the clock. They need to get to the vernal pools as early as possible in the year or else their young aren't going to make it. So this is a picture of a Jefferson salamander. Uh, this is a species that moves to vernal pools usually before any other amphibians if you're in a place that has Jefferson salamanders. And they've even been documented uh, crawling up through the snow using uh, the melted tunnels around the stems of vegetation or seedlings uh, to get to the pools, uh, even before wood frogs uh, ha have had a chance to do that. Uh, wood frogs have another trick up their sleeve. Uh, both wood frogs and spring peepers uh, can survive freezing solid. And that's a huge advantage to a vernal pool species because uh, that means they can overwinter just under the leaf litter. And as soon as the snow melts, the frog melts too, and they can pop right over to the vernal pool before species that overwinter um, below the frost line in places that you know, aren't going to freeze have even realized that it's spring. So going through uh, just some of our example species, we'll start with the spotted salamander. Um, this is a pretty common species. They're solid, mostly black with two rows of yellow spots down the back. They get about nine inches long. They have a short, broad snout. Uh, and although the species is often abundant at vernal pools, you'll also find them breeding in ponds and marshes, typically places that don't have fish or where the vegetation is so thick that large fish just aren't going to be in there eating the salamanders. And it surprises many people to learn that spotted salamanders can live uh, upwards of 20 years or more. That's a long time for, for a salamander. Their breeding ritual is actually quite complex. This is a... Uh, um, a video that a friend of mine recorded a number of years ago. Uh, so spotted salamanders, when they make it to these pools, sometimes in large numbers, uh, they'll start walking around each other. They'll all congregate in one spot. Sometimes they'll form like a ring and start just walking around each other in a circle. And eventually males and females will pair off. So here's just a, a video of that. Spring peepers calling in the background. I'm sorry, I realized I might not have actually hit the sound button when I, when I shared, but that's, uh, that's all right. Uh, what I really want to show you here is the uh, the salamander party. Uh, so when the spotted salamanders mate, uh, well, when any salamander mates, they have a very interesting way of, of doing that. Uh, so the male will deposit a little packet of sperm on the leaf litter. Uh, that's, that capsule of sperm is called a spermatophore. And then the female will basically just squat on it carry the spermat spermatophore off and she'll lay her eggs one or two days later. And the morning after that breeding party, uh, you might go to a vernal pool and see uh, something like this with no eggs yet. It'll be a day or so before the eggs arrive. Here's just a side view of the, uh, of the spermatophore and really close. I took this picture the, uh, the spring that I really got into macro photography. I thought it looked like a, like a little cloud on top of jelly, magical. Uh, so the eggs of spotted salamanders are pretty easy to recognize, usually attached to branches or vegetation um, within the vernal pool. Oftentimes there'll be lots of egg masses on a single branch. And uh, these egg masses, they're relatively firm. Uh, the eggs you'll see in the, the, the black spots in the egg mass, um, that entire mass is covered in an additional layer of jelly. So there's like half an inch of gel around um, the cluster of eggs. There might be 50 to 250 eggs within each of these masses. And uh, sometimes the egg masses of a spotted salamander can be gray or very opaque in coloration. 
And that is due to the genetics of the mother. So a salamander that lays these gray egg masses will always gray, lay gray egg masses. I'm often asked how the heck a spotted salamander lays an egg mass that ends up being the size of a baseball or larger. And the answer is they don't. It's a little hard to see here, but this is a picture you can see at the base of the salamander, she is laying eggs. Uh, the eggs start very small and then they gradually expand as they take in water, like one of those uh, like grow toys that you might remember from, uh, from childhood, put it in the water and grow a rubber shark. Um, over time, as the egg mass expands uh, and ages, um, you'll find algae inside the individual eggs and eventually a little larval salamanders beginning to form in there. And uh, those eggs will hatch in one or two months. And then the larval salamanders will metamorphose like those wood frogs in another two to four months after that. If they're breeding in permanent water, sometimes the young will actually stay in the wetland over winter and emerge the next spring, but that, that's not uh, normally how it works. The blue spotted salamander, this is one of my favorite Vermont species. Um, this is a small black salamander covered in blue spots or flecks. They get four or five inches long, short rounded snout. And uh, this actually is a species that they sometimes will breed in vernal pools, but they're more closely related to or associated with uh, semi-permanent wetlands or valley marshes. Um, so they're not one that, that we find that all that often in vernal pools, but, but sometimes. They don't lay egg masses, they lay individual eggs or just two or three eggs uh, together uh, attached to leaf litter or debris. Very hard to see these. And the Jefferson salamander. Um, this is definitely a vernal pool specialist, more so than the spotted salamander. You'll almost only find these, uh, these fellas breeding in vernal pools. And they're another largest salamander, up to seven inches long, uh, gray, brown, or bluish in coloration. Sometimes they'll have some gray or bluish flecking on their sides. They're not as heavy or broad as, a spot, as the spotted salamander. Uh, and they have long toes, but that's really only if you're comparing them to a blue spotted salamander and a squarish snout. Uh, the analogy that I like to use is that if you're trying to figure out, is it a blue spotted salamander or a Jefferson salamander, because they can look very similar, uh, the face is what I go straight to. Um, blue spotted salamanders, they've got that short rounded snout. I think of them as like the uh, the old Volkswagen bug. And then the Jefferson, Jefferson salamander, broader, longer, more rectangular, that is going to be the Volvo of the salamander face world. Jefferson salamander eggs, uh, very similar to spotted salamanders, but uh, smaller, less eggs per cluster, just 20 to 30 eggs. Uh, like the spotted salamander, there's this extra layer of gel around the mass. So you see the embryo, a membrane, and an extra layer of gel. And these are very loose, runny eggs. If you were to pick up spotted salamander eggs, the, the, the mass holds its shape, whereas Jefferson salamander eggs just like fall flat and almost they'll, they'll like ooze through your fingers if you open them up a little bit. Um, but it gets complicated. So uh, you might think this is a Jefferson salamander mass. Uh, however, Jefferson and blue spotted salamanders um, have hybrids that are much more abundant than either of the purebred species. And uh, those hybrid eggs have a high rate of infertile or dud, non-viable eggs that uh, start off looking normal, but then the eggs don't develop and they get colonized by mold that turns the eggs gray. So you can see eggs that look like Jefferson's, but half of them are dead and gray, probably a hybrid mass. And um, it's interesting, the purebred species actually don't breed with each other anymore. They're isolated enough that they are distinct species. Uh, the hybrids can breed with either uh, of the pure species. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how complicated it is, yeah, the hybrids are all female or they're almost all female. And when they breed with the males of the pure species, they usually don't even use his DNA. Uh, they discard entirely. Um, just the act of the little sperm entering the egg causes the development of that egg. And then the young are basically clones of the, uh, the hybrid female. But then rarely they'll incorporate some of that male DNA. It gets way complicated, way more complicated than I've just explained. Um, it's fat. You normally get into stuff like that when you're thinking about like ferns or plants, but some vertebrates can do it too. The Eastern Newt, this is one of our most common uh, Vermont species. Um, a little salamander, three or four inches long. Newts are salamanders. Uh, they can be orange, tan, or like olive green in coloration. Uh, red spots on the back circled in black. And they have rough skin compared to other salamanders that have like smooth, shiny, slimy skin. 
And what's really unique about eastern newts compared to any other salamander is that they have three parts to their life cycle. So whereas a spotted salamander has larvae and then a mature or a, a terrestrial version that looks like an adult or is an adult, uh, there are three stages of the eastern newt. The larvae, so all salamander larval forms have external gills on the back of their head, um, fins that are designed for swimming through the water. Uh, the eastern newt has a very broad, flat tail fin that extends up the back. Uh, they also have this black line through the eyes. Uh, but then they uh, um, metamorphose into a terrestrial juvenile called a red F. This is that orange one that you might find wandering around on the forest floor. And they can stay as a red F uh, for between two and eight years. They can stay on land for quite a long time. And that bright coloration is the reason why you can find them wandering through the forest floor out in the open. Nothing eats them because they are toxic and that orange coloration is a warning to predators. Eventually they go back to water. They look pretty much like a red F, but the color changes more to that olive coloration or dark brown. And if you look closely, this salamander, this newt still has the red spots on the back. And um, they're pretty adaptable. Um, Usually you'll find them in permanent water, but they can live in vernal pools too. And once the water dries up, they just go back to land, hang out under a log for a while. And then once the water returns, the salamander goes right back to the water. They don't lay egg masses like a spotted or Jefferson salamander, but they do eat the eggs of other amphibians. They'll eat anything that squirms and fits in their mouth um, or that they can tear pieces off of. Amphibian eggs, a great food source for them. So shifting out of salamanders into frog world, uh, the wood frog is one of the classic stereotypical vernal pool species. This is a brown or tan frog. They get about three inches in length. They have that dark raccoon mask on the face, a light upper lip, and uh, two ridges or lines down the back. Those are called dorsal lateral ridges. And their, their coloration, even though they're pretty much brown, can vary quite a bit. So this is a photo uh, that a friend of mine took of just a bunch of wood frogs they found one day uh, at, at a pool. And this just shows you the variety of different shades and colorations they can come in. Sometimes they'll have a light line right down the center of the back. And um, again, I'm not sure if you can actually hear this because I was a, uh, might have been a dummy and didn't actually hit the, uh, the share sound button. Uh, but if you can, their call is basically like ducks clucking. Uh, we'll make sure that you hear this uh, by the end here, um, even if it means I take a turn after uh, after a lair and uh, and Kevin go just so you can hear these sounds. And uh, you don't have to hear this video to see how goofy it is. Um, uh, wood frogs, when they uh, when they get to the vernal pools, the males arrive first and then they stay for weeks, whereas the females arrive a little bit later and they're in and out. They just need to breed once and then lay their eggs. And what that means is you get a lot of males for every female. And that can result in some kind of awkward situations where multiple males are trying to uh, mate or fertilize the eggs of uh, a single female. So you've got uh, one guy just going crazy on the side here. He's calling. Another one, I don't know what he's doing in the middle. And this, this uh, other one on the back of the female, he probably got there first because he's actually in a proper uh, breeding posture. And uh, sometimes the males get desperate. This is a video that uh, was submitted to the Reptile and Amphibian Atlas a few years ago of a wood frog trying to mate with the face of a uh, trout. Um, during the breeding season, they will grab onto anything that moves that looks kind of like a frog or that they think is a frog. Um, as it turns out, however, uh, wood frogs and trout have no business being in the same habitat as each other at all. This is a stocked pond and that is a skinny, hungry, thick looking fish. Um, so this is an ecological mismatch that ended weird. Wood frog eggs, uh, the cluster might be about the size of a softball. Um, eggs are black on top, white on bottom. There might be 500 to 2,000 eggs per mass. And unlike the salamander eggs, there isn't this layer of gel around the whole mass. So you have egg, membrane around the egg, and then no extra layer of gel. A lot of times wood frogs will all lay their eggs in one spot. So a whole pond might have, or pool might have no eggs. And then one branch sticking out of the water has all of the egg masses together. Spring peeper, uh, tan frog, dark X on the back. And um, sorry, I am going to actually stop here and just reshare, um, make sure that I actually hit the volume button. All right, it looks like I did. So that was an unnecessary step that I just took.
there we go. Sorry, the Zoom controls were covering my uh, my um, <laughs> presentation mode buttons. So uh, getting back here, what I wanted to make sure that you actually heard is um, the the call of the spring fever. So this is like the sound of spring, almost deafening when you get into the center of these choruses. And shifting out of amphibian world, spotted turtles are also a species that's closely associated with vernal pools. Uh, however, in Vermont, there are not many opportunities to see spotted turtles in a vernal pool because they're critically endangered. They get about five inches long, black with the yellow spots, orange on the legs. And this is a species that overwinters, they, they hibernate in permanent wetlands, but then during the summer, they might use several different wetlands or move across wooded land uh, to forage in vernal pools because when the vernal pool is there, it is full of food for a turtle. Frog, salamander, eggs, tadpoles, uh, lots of insects. This is like a buffet for spotted turtles. Um, so this is a video I wanna show you. Don't pay attention to the uh, uh, really grainy picture, um, but getting entirely out of vertebrates into the invertebrate world, uh, fairy shrimp are one of the classic vernal pool species. These are small filter feeders. They're crustaceans, although they're completely unrelated to the shrimp that we eat. Uh, some species really specialize in vernal pools. And um, the adults, they need to live in water, but of course, vernal pools dry up. Their eggs can survive prolonged periods of drought and might attach to the feathers or fur of animals that pass through them. And then they can be dispersed to other vernal pools. So um, just show you this video is going to look a lot better than the still. These are just some fairy shrimp swimming around on the surface. And of course, that's spring peepers off in the background. Lesser known than a fairy shrimp is the seed shrimp or ostracod. Uh, this I think of as a tiny hairy clam with legs, but they are crustacean. Uh, they're very difficult to see with the naked eye, um, easily overlooked. They only get a millimeter or two in length, and they can be a lot smaller than that. This is another species that um, their eggs can survive prolonged periods of drought, sometimes years. Um, and then the moment that those eggs are rehydrated, uh, they'll hatch and tiny little ostracods pop out. And those eggs can also attach to the fur or feathers of birds and mammals and be transported to other, um, other wetlands. You can find ostracods in literally every body of water from the Atlantic Ocean to the mud puddles in your backyard that only have water for a couple of days. Um, these things are everywhere. And uh, just a quick video of ostracods swimming around waving their, uh, their filter feeding phalanges. I don't know what to call those actually. Cool little animals, and you will find these. I, I, I don't think a single vernal pool out there lacks ostracods. And caddisfly or larval caddisfly. Um, you can find caddisflies in just about any body of fresh water, at least I'm not sure about salt water. Um, certain species, and there are hundreds, thousands of different types of caddisflies. Um, well, all of them are going to build protective cases out of something they find in the environment. Most species will build their casings out of uh, bits of sand or just like hard debris, fragments of shells. Um, but the ones that live in vernal pools uh, will actually build their casings out of just like needles and leaf litter. Um, uh, the bizarre caddisfly is a family of caddisflies. A lot of them specialize in vernal pools. Uh, this actually, I don't think, is a bizarre caddisfly. Um, but by cutting up leaves and making their casings out of these small pieces, they're actually uh, helping to advance decomposition in the pools and providing food for other species. And this is just a uh, video of one walking around on a vernal pool branch, carrying its weird little leaf shell protection case, protective case. And to close things out with the invertebrates, uh, fingernail clams. It surprises many people to learn that our forests have clams and they are very, very small. So this is uh, you know, obviously a, on the top of a pencil. This is a full-sized fingernail clam. It's actually several years old. And um, you can actually age this by counting growth rings. Um, so right here, if you can see my mouse, this would be the end of the first year, end of the second year, end of the third year, and then end of what is probably this clam's last year. Um, so quite small, uh, you can just find them in the leaf litter of the pools, um, and 
they're not in every vernal pool, but they're in, they're in quite a few. And the way that they disperse, um, I'm actually not sure if they can disperse via their eggs, uh, but the actual clams themselves can close shut and attach to the fur or feathers of, of those larger animals and be physically carried to another body of water. And it's actually pretty common to find them attached to the feet of salamanders. And I've actually seen uh, fingernail clams attached to the feet of Jefferson salamanders that were migrating to the vernal pools in the spring. So that Jefferson salamander had been on land underground for like 11 months. And that clam was on its feet the entire time. And then it goes back to the water and has the clam with it still. <laughs> very, very remarkable. Clams for feet. So, uh, you know, th those are just some of the examples of wildlife that uh, thrive in vernal pools, some that depend on vernal pools. My point here is that vernal pools are biodiversity hotspots. You can find some animals here that you can't find anywhere else. While many species of woodland animals depend on vernal pools, uh, hundreds if not thousands benefit from them. So when you have a vernal pool, that can really increase the amount of wildlife you will find in the wooded environment. And when it comes to amphibians, most frogs and salamanders can travel upwards of about 1,500 feet to the vernal pool. So that vernal pool is supporting, you know, 1,500 feet of forest in every single direction with its frogs and salamanders. Well, those that actually breed in vernal pools. You have some like redback salamanders that live entirely on land and lay their eggs on land. So uh, they're not all relying on vernal pools. Uh, but larger species can use vernal pools as well. Um, you have to focus on the left of this video. Uh, first, I'll draw your attention. There's an owl um, standing in this in this tree and right below it there is a congregation of wood frogs bre uh, breeding and laying their eggs and whoop, in comes a second barred owl. I didn't know the owls were going to do this or else I would have pointed the camera where the wood frogs were. I was hoping to capture a moose here um, but I have footage of these owls just going nuts and returning to this pool every single day for like a week straight. At one point three owls all at once uh, just eating wood frogs. Um, very important seasonal food source for animals. And I did eventually get footage of a moose, um, but I lost the original. I had to re-download this off of Facebook. So it's a really low resolution. Um, but this is a vernal pool, maybe 500 feet from that other one. Um, and uh, I saw lots of tracks. Finally, actually got one on camera. So uh, we probably wouldn't be talking here tonight unless there was uh, a threat to vernal pools. You know, these are critical habitat and unfortunately uh, we've lost quite a few of them and they can be very easily degraded. Um, there are a number of factors that can threaten vernal pools. First of all, just direct human disturbance, including the intentional draining and filling of vernal pools. Uh, climate change can uh, degrade vernal pools because a lot of these fill up with snow melt in the spring. Um, and in a changing climate, there's less snow, which means the rain, the, the um, you know, you have this more of like gradual um, running of water <laughs> over the uh, over the forest floor and into these depressions. And they might not actually fill up all at once to end up with less water or no water collecting at all. And of course, rains, uh, rain patterns can also be affected by climate change. And I, I think back to the year 2016, when I first moved back to Vermont from after spending a few years in Texas, I was so excited uh, to get back out to those vernal pools and where I was living, most of them didn't even fill up with water. And those that did dried out by like late June. So the very few that actually did have amphibian eggs in my neck of the woods, none of those eggs actually hatched. Thankfully, frogs and salamanders, um, you know, they'll live multiple years. Spotted salamanders, more than 20, they can live to fight another day. But when you come to like long-term climactic trends and maybe 10 years of drought in a row, that can have a huge impact on amphibians. Um, thankfully, all wetlands in Vermont are protected, technically, and we'll get into that uh, a little more in just a few minutes, um, and then uh, then I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, to Alaire. So, because vernal pools dry out, they can be very very difficult to identify unless you're there in late winter, early spring, uh, and they're so small that you can't see them from aerial photographs. Uh, so, many vernal pools are not on wetland maps. Uh, so while in Vermont, all wetlands have some sort of legal protection, if a wetland isn't actually mapped, it isn't really protected because there's no way to know that a vernal pool has been uh, drained or developed or just destroyed um, because nobody knew it was there to begin with. Uh, there are several ways that you can recognize vernal pools, even when the water is gone. Um, and I got out of order here. So um, ways to recognize vernal pools in the summer. 
Um, so here we have like, you know, in the spring, there's water, there's some vegetation around here that you don't find in areas that don't have vernal pools. This is a uh, false skunk cabbage all around the vernal pool. And when that vernal pool dries out, uh, this plant will still be there. So that's an immediate clue that this is a wetland that just doesn't have water right now. And, um, you know, these forest, these depressions that are full of uh, vegetation are often associated or uh, sorry, will have other wetland species as well, or species that are you know, usually but not always found in wetlands. Um, you know, either there'll be an opening in the forest floor because the trees don't do very well in these places that are more saturated than the surrounding woodlands. So when you walk into an opening that has like weird plants that you don't find anywhere else in the forest and you're a little bit lower than the rest of the forest and there aren't any trees, it's a good clue that it's a vernal pool. Uh, another thing you can look at is um, the leaves themselves. When you get those depressions in the woods, you might notice that the leaves are darker and more decomposed than the leaves elsewhere in the forest. That's a good clue that this is a vernal pool. And if you peel back the leaf litter, you might even find the shells of, of um, uh, fingernail clams. Or if you go a little bit deeper, the actual living fingernail clams themselves. They can survive without water, um, but they need to stay moist. So you find them down a little bit deeper. And certain ferns and sedges uh, can also indicate that this might be a vernal pool, even if there's no water. Um, Oops, and I'm just gonna, because I went out of order a little bit. Um, you know, back to the point of wetlands being protected, but vernal pools not being mapped. Uh, this is a area that I've spent a bit of time uh, with a layer actually. Um, and lots of, lots of vernal pools on this particular ridgeline, uh, the mapped wetlands, this is what is formally protected, uh, what's on the map. But if you turn on uh, the vernal pools, um, there are lots of them here, and many of these uh, aren't, or rather weren't, formally mapped. Um, and if they're not mapped, they're not protected. And thankfully, a lot of this land is already conserved, so there's no concern about these vernal pools being degraded significantly. Uh, and it was the Vermont Land Trust that protected these particular vernal pools and the surrounding forest. So uh, when it comes to conservation of vernal pools, um, you know, I'll just I'll just leave it really simple here. Uh, basically, they needed a buffer of woodlands around them. Um, there are a couple different levels that we think about, and, but for the most part, there's this 100 foot zone around a vernal pool that just should not be disturbed to the greatest extent possible. And um, any forestry activities that are occurring in that 100 foot buffer, ideally um, should be done to improve vernal pool habitat, perhaps through a selective, like a thinning cut just to open up the canopy a little bit. But for the most part, that 100 foot zone, I think of it as just a, a do not touch zone. And then there's this broader area up to uh, about 400 feet where just like, minimizing the amount of disturbance to the greatest extent possible is ideal. And you still want to maintain that as forested habitat, um, but maybe not with as dense of forest cover as on top of the pool itself. Um, but the bottom line here is uh, it's a woodland habitat. It needs to be surrounded by woodlands. You know, you could extend this buffer out to 1500 feet and it would be even better than a 400 foot zone. Um, but 400 feet, I, I think that's pretty good. And none of this really means anything if the pool isn't mapped. Uh, Kevin will tell you a bit about that at the end of our joint presentation. But for now, I'm going to pause there and turn it over to Alaire from the Vermont Land Trust. Great, thanks, Kylie. That was great. Um, if you are able to stop sharing then i will share my screen yep hang on hi and while we're transitioning there i just want to thank kylie kylie you've always got these incredible photos and videos and it's just so fun to see some of these species moving around that i you never really i never really get to see um so thank you again for sharing that so i'm going to get mine going here So Kylie just gave us such a great overview of all the species that live in vernal pools, um, these special animals that are only found in these places and they need them uh, or, or really rely on these really unique and special spots for breeding. Um, and so there, though they may, you may see a spotted salamander somewhere else other than a vernal pool, 
Um, these places are really critical for those species um, for their survival. Um, and one thing that I wanted to really emphasize now is kind of going from the pool out into the surrounding forest, because when we think about what makes a, a healthy vernal pool, what makes these places be able to function in the ways that support all of those species that we just learned about, it's really the forest around them. Um, sometimes I hear vernal pools described as like a puddle in the woods, um, but the, to me, the critical part of that is like, it's in the woods. Um, if you just had a, a little pool of water in the middle of a field, okay, maybe some frogs would go there, some, some something would be living there, but it's really the woods that makes it what it is. And I just wanna start with something that maybe seems, seems obvious. And from this photo of spotted salamander eggs um, from a pool down in Springfield, Vermont, and looking back to the photos that Kylie shared, all of those eggs were on branches, you know, that, and when you said it, Kylie, that the um, that the salamanders and the frogs, like their eggs are often attached to branches. And you wouldn't have branches if you didn't have trees above dropping those branches. Maybe that seems obvious, but I think it's really worth pointing out. You wouldn't have that leaf litter as it decomposes, produces really vital minerals um, and nutrients for all those species. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of this forested setting um, and what we all can do to, to promote it to promote great habitat for these species, not only for the breeding season when they're in the vernal pools and using those, but also for when they're out in the woods for the rest of the year, when those salamanders are out there with their little clam, um, <laughs> clam feet walking around. So just a view um, to sort of emphasize this, here's a trout lily, something that I'm hoping I'll start to see pretty soon. I haven't seen, seen them yet um, up here in Northern Vermont where I am, but a trout lily with a vernal pool in the background. So this is a, looks like mostly hardwood forest surrounding a vernal pool. Um, and it's, as Kylie said, the forest around vernal pools is really, it's, it supports so many other species that rely on the pools for um, some important part of their, their life cycle. So whether it's those owls or the moose that are coming in for some early spring vegetation or early spring you know, feeding on frogs um, that have just thawed out from the winter, they're providing this really important service at a time of the year um, that is pretty tough for a lot of animals in the woods. You know, your animals coming out of hibernation, things aren't really growing. A lot of insects haven't um, started moving around yet or aren't there yet. Um, birds might be just coming back. So vernal pools are producing this really incredible pulse of nutrients and um, that really supports life around, around the forest in general. And this picture is of a, a vernal pool. Um, Actually, I believe this is one that we will be visiting. Um, for those of you who might want to join us, Kylie and I are leading a walk on May 12th in St. Johnsbury, and this is one of the pools on that property. But I wanted to show this picture just because it it really shows the like a healthy forest surrounding a vernal pool. Um, some characteristics of that forest: lots of trees, trees of different ages and sizes, trees that have fallen and are, are in varying stages of decomposition. Those are providing shelter, and as they're decomposing, they're providing um, nutrients and biomass um, to, to build up the, the organic layer on the forest floor. And what you're seeing in the sort of the middle of the photo, there's some, some large tree trunks. There's one covered with moss um, in the pool itself. When I assess vernal pools for Vermont Land Trust, I'm always looking around those kind of fallen trees in the middle of the pool to look for egg masses. Um, they provide a little bit of shade and shelter in the pool itself, but then out in the forest floor, they're slowly decomposing and providing shelter for animals when they're moving through the woods. Um, and the fine branches that are right in the foreground of the picture, I think are just really important because, you know, these are just fine branches. They decompose fairly quickly. They're falling off of trees. Trees are shedding them as they're just growing and, and living in the woods. Um, and those are providing really important shelter for salamanders throughout the, the year, um, as well as you know, many other small creatures that are that are in the forest. So I just want to emphasize that all of these, all of this wood in whatever stage of growth, um, aging, decomposition, and just falling, just physically falling onto the forest floor are also important. And this is the kind of place that really supports a healthy vernal pool. Another important piece um, with this picture is that you see that there's places in the pool that are pretty shady, other places that are sunny. Um, I have been really lucky in my job with the land trust to be able to go out and visit just all kinds of rural pools all over Vermont. I see really, they're really different. There's not just one healthy pool um, kind of search image that I'm looking for. Um, some of them are in pretty open areas with a lot of hardwood trees. And so when we're out there this time of year, it's just, there's no leaves, it's completely sunny. There are places where the ice um, melts in the pool really early on. 
and providing that really early um, place for, for the frogs and salamanders in that particular patch of woods to come and visit. Somewhere like this, um, you're in St. Johnsbury, you're in more of a softwood stand, the ice can stick around for a longer period of time. And those pools are just, they just get started a little bit later. Um, there's a really, there's an interesting value to all of these different kinds of diverse settings for vernal pools. Um, in some years when, <clears throat> when, there, when there isn't a lot of snow, where there is a lot of snow, vernal pools that might be in, in the shade might do better one year. Vernal pools that are in more of in a hardwood stand um, where they're going to get that full sun really early on might do better. Um, and so they're, they're dynamic ecosystems. And I think that's, that's an important piece to remember too, is that they, one pool, pool might be deep and stick around for longer into the summer one year, the next year, maybe not. Um, and so there's all, all of these settings, but really what they all have in common is that they're in forests that are, have trees of different ages, pretty dense forests, um, and tree and a lot of woody material on the ground, both coarse and, and what we call fine woody material. Let's see here, next picture. This is just another example of a pool that I really like. Um, this is one up in Sutton um, in the Northeast Kingdom. It's in kind of a natural little valley that was had sort of bedrock ledges on both sides of it. You can see there's a pretty well decomposed tree trunk in the middle of it and then fine, um, fine branches falling down in as well, trees of different ages and leaning over into that natural depression. So just another example of a, a forested setting that's a little more hardwood dominated, but a great, really healthy vernal pool. Go backwards here. Ah, <laughs> I'm moving. Um, let's see here. So I wanted to take, here's where I want to be, take a moment and just talk about how Vermont Land Trust thinks about vernal pools and how we protect them in our conservation easements. Um, so this is a, just an example of one of our conserved properties. This is the Andrewstown Forest in Richmond, Vermont. Um, whenever we start a new conservation project, one of the things we do is we do an assessment for vernal pools. And that's one of my fa the favorite parts of my job is to be able to do that start out looking remotely. We use um, remote data layers from other, um, there's a statewide layer of potential vernal pools. We talked to folks like Kylie, we talked to people like Kevin from Vermont Center for Eco Studies um, to sometimes to get a sense of whether there might be a pool somewhere. When we do get that signal that there might be a pool, we go check it out. Um, and in this case, there are two pools on the Andrewstown Forest property that I documented. Um, there's always a potential to miss one. There's one right up here, sort of right in the upper, central part of the property. And then there's one down in the eastern, eastern part of the property. Um, what we do then is we go out, check them out, decide if they're state significant vernal pools. So we go through a whole process um, with the state natural heritage program um, with fish and wildlife, determine that they are. And then what we do is I recommend that in the easement, those pools get protected um, with large buffers. And those buffers are based on research like what Kylie was showing earlier. So we really recommend that in the first 100 feet around the pool and in the pool itself, there's no disturbance um, at all. So no cutting of trees. Um, you know, if there's a trail or a road, something can stay, but that there isn't any forest management in that first buffer just to really protect um, the, the woody material on the floor to let the forest be that really diverse, uneven aged forest stand um, with a dense canopy that provides enough shade for the pool to keep it from drying out early. Um, and then in the area beyond that, we actually recognize that there's a 600 foot total buffer around the pool itself. So the first 100 feet is the that no touch zone. And then that area between 100 and 500 feet um, we still recognize that that's important habitat for vernal pool dependent creatures, specifically the, those spotted salamanders, the Jefferson salamanders and the blue spotted salamanders for the rest of their year of life, um, you know, throughout the year, um, other than the breeding season, recognizing that um, research has shown that they spend most of their time within about 600 feet of the pool um, where they're born. And so we, we add additional protections to that 100 to 500 foot zone, so to the next 600 feet around the pool. Um, what that looks like in in um, when Vermont Land Trust, a Vermont Land Trust easement is um, closed, this is a really hard picture to see um, just because of the aerial photo that we used. Um, but that those pools have these sort of a primary zone, and then we call a secondary zone. Um, the primary zone can can be 
enrolled in the current use program. So if a landowner is in Vermont, um, this is a, a program that forest land can be enrolled in um, with a, a tax incentive. And then the area outside of that is actually quite large from that 100 to 500 feet, uh, 100 to 600 feet, sorry. Um, and in those areas, we're just making sure that we're look, working with the landowner and their forester um, to have management that's not creating large um, open um, patches of, uh, of timber cutting. Um, so small patch cuts, single tree, um, single trees that can be cut are fine, but we don't wanna go beyond that. Um, so what does that look like on the ground? Usually um, it looks like just good forest management. And so when that when we're at in that 100 to 600 feet, um, I just wanna make the, the point that what we're looking for here is like a forest that looks kind of messy. And so this is a, a picture from the Andrewstown Forest in Richmond that was pretty close to the vernal pool. I'm not sure if this was within 600 feet, but it's probably within a thousand feet of the vernal pool. Um, after some forest management was done in 2020, and you can just see piles of, there's some logs, there's some branches, there's things on the ground. It doesn't look like it's neatly raked and cleaned up like a lawn. And I think what's really important for me when I'm thinking about how do our forests stay healthy enough to support not just the physical pool and the water that's in it, but all of the species that rely on those pools um, in every way, is that we want a forest that actually has a lot of like structure in it. So the, the wood on the ground, the wood and the trees, not cleaning it out. And so this is a, something that, I think for a lot of people, it takes some getting used to because it doesn't necessarily look neat and cleaned up, but it's actually ecologically really healthy, diverse, wonderful place to be. Um, here's another picture um, following some forest management in another area um, where there's a vernal pool nearby. And so you can see this is a little bit more of a small patch that was opened up by cutting some trees, but then leaving these piles of branches, which can be great shelter for those, those large salamanders to go and spend um, time during the rest of the, the year. Another piece with, that we love to talk about with forest landowners in terms of keeping vernal pool um, habitats healthy is leaving legacy trees. So these trees you can see are two just like large old sugar maples um, in a, a piece of land down in Starksboro. Um, you can see they're shedding branches, they're dropping, they're just creating that excellent vernal pool um, supporting habitat through, through their life cycles. And that's what, when we have these kind of forests that are diverse, that have trees of different ages and sizes that are dropping their branches, those branches are decomposing, they're providing the physical structure for the amphibians to lay their eggs. Then we get these beautiful pools like this that are not just beautiful to look at, but they, they are just teeming with life um, the way that we just saw in those videos. Um, and then I, you know, they're producing life like this. And I love this photo because I think if you look closely at it, you can see multiple different species um, that Kylie just talked about. There's a little, fingernail clam in the lower left. There's some wood frog tadpoles in the upper left. Uh, there's some caddisfly cases. Kyle, I love that there's a whole category of caddisflies called bizarre caddisflies. <laughs> um, they're, they're so cool. Um, these are, cat, this is the type of caddisfly I see in vernal pools all the time. And then over here, there's a little shadow of a, I think this is an insect called a water boatman. So this is the kind of diversity that we get um, when we really have these thriving forests. We have these thriving wetlands within them. Um, and now I want to just turn to Kevin Tolan from Vermont Center for Eco Studies, who's going to share a little bit about what you can do to protect vernal pools in your woods. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk. I'm going to quickly pull up my screen to show something that VCE and Vermont Fish and Wildlife have been working together um, on for a couple of years now. So I saw someone with a question of, I have a map pool on my land, or I have a, I have a pool on my land and it's not mapped. Um, this is what you want to check out, the Vermont Vernal Pool Atlas, vpatlas.org. Um, once you get to the website, you can click View Pools up here, and it pulls up. And it's going to be a little bit glitchy, so I'm going to try not to scroll too much. But each of these dots is either a confirmed or potential vernal pool. Um, if it's not dark blue, it means it's not confirmed yet. So all these orange dots were mapped using GIS or other technologies. Um, and now we're looking for people to go out to these sites and check them out and verify that they're vernal pools. Or if you know a vernal pool, you can add it into here yourself. The biggest issue with getting pools confirmed, other than getting people out there to look at the pools, is we need landowner permission to confirm sites. 
Um, just the way that like the laws work and in partnering with Vermont Fish and Wildlife, this is the official um, wetland inventory for vernal pools. It feeds right into ANR. Um, you know, we partner together with this very closely on them with them. So we have to make sure we're doing everything exactly how we need to do it. So landowner permission is integral or else it can't be fully confirmed and get that full status as a protected wetland. So I'm just going to zoom in quickly to Woodbury because I know that Kylie's been monitoring a pool there. So zoom into Woodbury and you can start seeing a little bit closer where all these sites are. Um, if you zoom in right in the middle here, this is Woodbury Town Forest. Let me just put on the Google satellite view. And so you see there's three confirmed sites in Woodbury. So now say they weren't confirmed or you're interested in going out to check out the vernal pools, you can go out there yourself, fill out a data sheet and submit it to this website, basically doing the, uh, the, those field surveys for us, um, or I guess for the state or for, for everyone in Vermont, right? So that's especially important if you're near one of these orange dots, which is, um, you know, we've looked at the site using different image layers and it looks like there might be a depression there or there might be standing water there. You can lug out to that site, you know, scout around a little bit, be like, no, there isn't a vernal pool here. And then we can know that we can remove it and we don't have to worry about it for the state wetland inventory anymore. Or it may be a vernal pool that uh, the next time the land changes ownership, um, the, the pool might get developed because it's not mapped. And as Kylie said, if it's not mapped, it's really hard to protect things. Um, so you can go out and do that legwork yourself, get these on the wetland map, really easy to submit. You can just sign up right on the website. Um, we do have some resources to help with this. If you go back to the website, the main page and click the Vermont Vernal Pool Mapping Project link, it pulls up like the main landing page for that. It has some species profiles that goes over how to identify the egg masses of all the species you might find or the species that we look for, um, similar to how Kylie's described them. And there are also some materials such as a video going over how to use the website, um, a link to the data sheet, or you can download the data sheet to your phone and use your phone to do that for you. I'm really hoping to do a, an expansive webinar on this next year. Um, we just now finished up the second iteration of it. It's, uh, you know, it's a pretty bare bones project. We only have one developer that's done all of it. Um, so we're still trying to get it all up to speed, but I'm really hoping by next year, we'll be in a really good spot that we can uh, you know, do a big, big webinar for everyone in you know, all VLT landowners or whoever else, um, and hopefully make sure that people are you know, knowing about this and know that you need to get your site map to make sure it has the fullest protections possible. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the chance to talk about that real quick. Great, thank you, Kevin, so much. Yeah, and Vermont Center for Eco Studies is such a great, it's a wealth of information. Um, the the Vernal Pool Atlas is such a great tool and the Vernal Pool Mapping Project data is something that I use a lot in my work at, the, at Vermont Land Trust. So really grateful to have such a, an excellent kind of research-based, uh, research-based but really practical organization in the state. So it's, it's a great resource. Um, we just have a few minutes left, but I think we can get to some of the questions. Um, I am going to put up our closing slide here just for a moment so you can see our um, what we've got coming up in the next couple of weeks around vernal pools. And I've got a, I think I'm just going to show it here. Um, but yeah, we've got a few questions on, what? <laughs> sorry again, you've seen my, <laughs> ah, got some technological issues here. Um, but while I'm figuring that out, um, Kylie, would frogs and salamanders, can they, they don't both freeze solid. It's just salam. It's just the frogs, right? Yeah, and, frogs. and it's just, it's just certain types of frogs. So in Vermont, um, we have 11 or 12 species of frog. And the only ones that, that can freeze are the wood frogs, spring peeper, and the, um, gray tree frog. So the rest of them can't. And um, as far as I'm aware, no North American salamander can freeze. Um, the only salamander that can freeze that I know about is the Siberian salamander, which is another, which is another newt actually. Cool. 
Um, we had a question about the, the evolutionary, like, is there any evolutionary connection, do you think, between the, the why, why do wood frogs sound like ducks? Is there, is there something there? I mean, like, why does any animal sound like anything? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe, but um, I, as far as I know, it's just the sound they make. Okay. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> nice. It's a very basic sound. Both duck, yeah. ducks make the most basic sounds of any bird. They're pretty early on evolutionary, evolutionarily. Um, ducks, <laughs> the wood frogs just make the easiest sound they can. Yeah, who's to say the ducks aren't impersonating the frogs? Um, yeah. And here's another one. How long do um, Eastern newts live in their aquatic form? Uh, aquatic form. Um, Usually, the, it will just be a a season. They should make it out um, before the uh, before the winter. Sometimes they may overwinter um, and come out the uh, the following year. But in in some places, they actually never become terrestrial again. Um, some salamanders can um, are what's called a uh, neotanic, which means like they retain their juvenile or larval characteristics. And um, a small percent of eastern newts just about anywhere um, might be neotanic. So they'll become adult without ever losing their gills and they'll stay in the water their whole lives. Mm. Um, but what's really fascinating is in urban environments, Eastern newts have persisted even in Central Park in New York. Um, however, they did that by ditching the terrestrial F stage. Um, the point, the whole purpose of a red F, the terrestrial stage is to go colonize a new wetland. Um, I mean, they're really adapted to beaver ponds, which are temporary, not the way that vernal pools are temporary, you know, vernal pool is there every year, but then like disappears for a little while every year. Beaver wetlands might be there for 20 years straight and then disappear. So if you're an Eastern newt um, and the wetland disappears, it's kind of handy that the young, their young might be on land for eight years looking for new habitat. But if you're an Eastern New York, uh, Eastern newt in Central Park, New York, where is that F going to go other than pavement, uh, you know, or like a parking lot or a, or a very busy road? Um, so over time, just because a small number of those newts had that neotanic trait, um, they're the ones that survived. So in urban environments, um, there's some populations of eastern newts where almost all of them stay in the water their whole life. They go from larva to adult, skipping the F, but retaining the gills. It's, it's cool. Hmm. That's fascinating. So cool. Um, I think I, we'll just take one. Uh, we've got a couple of different questions here. I'm going to say somebody said, asked if, they have a vernal pool on their land, but it has not been documented um, in the state system yet. Who do they contact? Um, I always contact Mark Ferguson from the Heritage Program from Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Um, he, if you look up Vermont Fish and Wildlife Natural Heritage Program, he should be on there. But Kevin, is that something that some people could reach out to you about if they find a vernal pool? Is that something you want to learn? I'd, I'd say do Mark first. Um, I'm really fun at this time of year between Metalark stuff and some other vernal pool work. So I just can't, unfortunately I can't get out to all the map sites, um, but I know that yeah. Vermont Fish and Wildlife has people that can. Um, and I mean, yeah, I'll still answer you and try and walk you through the mapping pro process on our end too. So anyone, either one works. Yeah. Kevin, um, could you, could people use the, uh, the app for confirming a vernal pool to send you data about one that's not mapped at all? Yes. Yeah. So if you open up the pool, uh, if you open up that app, I showed you the website's directions on how to actually download it. Um, it downloads to your phone. And even if you're outside of cell service, you can open it up. It'll load all the vernal pools in the system. And if you're not near one, you can say this pool wasn't mapped and add in the information from there. Awesome. It's a great resource. I want to recognize that we are um, at 802 so that folks should feel free to leave as they need to. I think we just have a couple more questions. So I'm happy to stay on for five more minutes if we want to just get to those. Um, but bef before we do, just to note that we have a few upcoming events um, with Vermont Land Trust, three vernal pool walks um, in Wells, Barry, and St. Johnsbury. So all throughout the state. So if you're interested in getting out to a vernal pool, check our website, vlt.org, um, and register for one of those walks. Kylie and I will be out on the one on May 12th in St. Johnsbury, which will be, be really fun. We've also got a spring wildflower webinar on April 27th. So thanks so much, everybody, for that. Um, and so let's let's just pop on to these final questions here. Um, 
Making new vernal pools. I this is something that people I get asked um, occasionally. So Jill is saying, are there successful examples of making new vernal pools? Um, this is something that I tend to I tend to say, well, vernal pools are in the woods. They're they're, they're where they are for a reason. There's a topo topographic sort of setting where they can be, and there's a drainage setting. There's a forest around them, and there, and that's all those factors combined and make a place where there can be a healthy vernal pool. Um, it seems like making new ones, there's a lot of variables that we don't necessarily understand. And so to try to, to create one, um, it's more than just creating a depression in the ground and filling it with water. Um, so I, I tend to say, let's focus on the pools that we know about that are, that are healthy. Um, and because there's also a risk of sort of inadvertent vernal pools, like tractor ruts or, or ruts from vehicles that are driving in wet places in the woods can fill with water. And like Kylie said, those wood frogs are gonna attach to a fish and try to mate with it. They will also lay their eggs anywhere they can. I've seen so many wood frog eggs in puddles made by vehicle ruts. Those eggs have no, no hope. And so it's really almost like a waste of that animal's reproductive effort to be laying an egg in a, in a rut. So I worry about vernal pool, well-intentioned, but maybe not um, completely, um, ecologically, like there, not all the pieces are there in a pool that somebody creates and it maybe isn't the best habitat to support those species into the future. But I'd love to hear um, Kylie or Kevin, if you guys have thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it can work. I don't know if it's always worth it every time. Um, like there's been research where some have been very productive. I think a lot of times people just get a backhoe, dug a, dig a hole, and the soil might not be clay, might not be close to bedrock, there might not be enough leaf litter, so it just doesn't hold water. I think that the money or time spent doing it, unless like, you know, you're very strategic about it and intentional, I think that time and effort can be better spent um, with other conservation efforts, such as, you know, de-littering uh, vernal pool. I know some that are absolutely disgusting with you know, car tires and stuff in them. Yeah. So the lot can be done. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that sounds, that sounds right. And, uh, I know there, yeah, people have done it, um, constructed vernal pools, but, uh, they are, it's an, it's an art, <laughs> um, yeah. and, uh, they, they don't, they don't all keep, um, and real quick, uh, Alaire, um, did we, uh, just, just to clarify uh, for this vernal pool walk schedule, um, was May 12th, May 12th was the backup date. Um, I have the, uh, April 21st as the, as the, um, Another option. <laughs> Did we, oh, uh, the other is option. That, yeah. Is that gone now, or is it still uh, April twenty first? Oh, okay. I thought we had decided to go with the twelfth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's. <laughs> we, we, the two of us will figure that out. Uh, we'll figure that afterwards. out. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so um, everybody can check check uh, online if because uh, it's not going to be both. It's going to be one or the other. It'll be one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> um. Great. So yeah, let's see. So I think we've got resources to document vernal pools in Georgia. I am a um, assuming you mean the state of Georgia. I am not aware of those, but I would say to check in with your with the state um, Fish and Wildlife Program or Natural Heritage Program, um, of which there should be one in, in each um, state. I've um, got a question on, this spring has been cool and wet where I live, Amherst, Mass. I heard very few frogs or peepers. Does that indicate a bad year for species that need vernal pools in the sun and a small number of offspring this year? Or is it just annoying for humans? Um, it's cool wet spring. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd hazard last year was a drought. So if it's a drought last year, bad breeding, less offspring, less returning this year. Um, you know, and, and a lot of these populations do go through booms and busts. Some, mm -hmm. you know, we don't know exactly the time period, but every five years, there might be a massive, massive boom of eggs. And then a couple of years, they'll have a bust after. So mm -hmm. natural processes, it could be a lot of things, but that's my guess. Yeah, and um, yeah, another factor that can really influence that is if you have a really cold winter with very little snow, um, even though wood frogs and spring peepers can freeze, they can only get oh so cold before they're too frozen and die. Um, so when, they, when I say they can freeze, it's like they can get down to, I think, 26-ish degrees and stay that way for a couple, a couple weeks. Um, but if they get colder than that or stay frozen longer than that, um, you know, you can have a, a, a die off, especially if it's that snowless year with really cold temperatures, you can have a lot of those, a lot of those frogs dying. Um, 
Although interestingly, uh, if you go up to Alaska, um, the wood frogs there can survive much colder temperatures for much longer periods of time. So there seems to be like, they're adapted for the typical conditions where they live. And you get those atypical years cool. and uh, you might end up with a lot less frogs the next, the next spring. Yeah. Hmm. All right, how do newts hatch from their eggs? Uh, yeah. I, Interesting. I've never thought about how they hatch from their eggs, um, but any uh, I, I've I've watched spotted salamanders egg eggs hatch. So um, over over time, when those embryos start to look like little larval salamanders, and and they'll start wriggling around inside the egg, um, eventually the egg mass just starts to break apart, and um, just by wriggling violently, the uh, the larval salamander can bust out of its uh, little membrane. And at that point, the surrounding jelly uh, holding the whole mass together is largely degraded. Mm. And I would assume Eastern newts hatch in much the same way, except that um, they don't have the extra layer of gel to fight through. They're just a little, little egg in a membrane mm. on its own on yeah. the cool floor. Would love to see a video of that, either of those things happening. Um, all right, and so our last question tonight, this is actually from, not from a vernal pool, but it's about red-backed salamanders. Um, is it... Our, our um, guest is asking if you think it would be valid to use a survey of redback salamanders as a proxy for forest floor health. Um, there was a paper in the 1970s from Sam, I think, Droga, um, who did this. And just wondering if um, that would be something that either of you know about. I don't know. I don't know much about that, but. I, I, would, uh, um, I would say yes. Um, that's my assumption. A healthy forest tends to have more redback salamanders, and mm -hmm. they are a very easy and abundant. Well, they're an easy species to find. They tend to be very abundant where, whenever their needs are met, and mm -hmm. there are standardized methods. Well, I shouldn't say standardized. There are protocols for monitoring redback salamanders using artificial cover, because um, it's you know every forest has a different. I've got cats fighting at my feet. They're, I was supposed to feed them like half an hour ago, and they they're. <laughs> getting mad uh, but uh yeah every forest floor is different so it's hard to compare one to the other when their covers is different but um you can use artificial cover to sort of standardize how you're monitoring for for the amphibians and, and redback salamanders will start using that pretty quickly so um i i just i haven't specifically read of them as an indicator species for forest health the way that macroinvertebrates in the stream indicate stream health, but it, it would make a lot of sense. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd advocate for using invertebrates over redbacks. Um, since the 70s, I mean, that's been 50 years, so much has come out about IDing insects in that time and uh, you know, insect um, abundance. You can take the taxon that an, in, that an insect or arachnid or anything, how big it is, and you can immediately take that, transfer it to caloric, caloric intake, um, biomass. Um, I think that that could potentially be a better ecosystem level because um, that would probably respond better to herbicides and get more of what's going on with the microbes. But you know, there are so many ways you can go about those questions. You know. That might that be that'd be a whole grad project in itself comparing the two. That might be a whole PhD project, actually. <laughs> yeah. Off you go. <laughs> <Enough>. <laughs> well, everyone, that was those are our questions. And I'm I thank you, Kylie, Kevin, for sticking around to answer the rest of them. Um, really appreciate you both coming and joining us here and and helping us um, all and us in our community understand vernal pools a bit better. This is this has been really fun. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for a lot. And, yeah. And um, all of our guests, thank you so much for coming. And you'll see a survey in your email in the next day or two. Um, and you might have a link to it, I think, even when you leave the Zoom call. And the recording for this will be up on our website in a couple of days. And we invite you to check out our website, vlt.org, for more information on this and other upcoming opportunities. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.